I carefully put a jacket on today because in my experience in air-conditioned American universities, it's always too cold. So um, I see most of you have already taken your jackets off. I think yes. in a few moments, please encourage them to do decency or not, I shall take my chairman's jacket off. Uh, I'm Will Ryan, I'm from the Warburg Institute in London, uh, and it's my privilege to introduce the first session. I'm not going to waste time on long introductions because we want to talk. Uh, let me just say that our first two speakers in this session are the great organizers of this great conference. Moshe uh, Alexander Kulik. Moshe, um, I think you know them both, don't you, all of you? Is anyone? Yes, I think they're well known. Um, <laughs> Professor Tava is um, a professor of uh, linguistics and Russian, in effect, yes. And uh, Alexander is uh, currently chairman of the uh, Slovak Republic. And the, you'll speak in first, I'm sure you will. Yeah. 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 Professor Tava will speak first. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay on the intricacies of transmission of Jewish texts in a Slavic milieu, case study, the third capture of Jerusalem, and the Yossi point. Thank you. I hope you all have your handouts. It's in there. Oh, there are some more for those who do not have handouts.
For my part, I would like to focus on phenomena of direct impact. From among these, one could mention the adoption of the local tongue by Jews settling in Slavic land, as it was done everywhere else in all corners of the diaspora. The Slavic lands are referred to in Jewish medieval sources as Canaan, Canaan, and the Slavic language as the language of Canaan. The kinds of evidence pointing to this process of adoption are, for example, Slavic losses in Hebrew rabbinical writings, both exegetic, exegetical and juridical, or Slavic names, especially of women, attested on tombstones in Jewish cemeteries from very early on. Evidence of such adoption is also a letter from the community of Salonika dated to the 12th century, which recommends to neighboring Jewish communities a monolingual Jew from the community of Russia, who is on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and requires assistance and guidance, since, I quote, he knows neither the Holy Tongue, nor Greek, nor Arabic, but only the language of Canaan spoken by the men of his native land, end of quote. Yiddish, which became the dominant language of Ashkenazi Jewry, and which was and remains a Germanic language, despite what a certain scholar from Tel Aviv may think, <laughs> has had a Slavic lexical component from its very beginning. And the influence of Slavic on its lexicon and grammar increased with time. To some of the aspects of this Slavic influence on Yiddish grammar, I devoted several of my studies. But I will not elaborate on this aspect today. Professor Moscovich, in his talk, will surely do that. The type of direct interaction, uh, of direct interaction phenomenon I would like to elaborate upon is translations. And by that, I mean translations from Hebrew into Slavic, of which we have quite a few. The questions raised by these translations are many. When, where, and why? were they made? By whom were they commissioned? By whom were they executed? Who was the intended readership? Who was the actual readership? Why were these particular texts translated? Let me tell you at once that there are no agreed answers to any of these questions. All of them have been and still are being hotly debated, not least by some of the speakers present here. The corpus of translations made <coughs> from Hebrew into East Slavic falls into two chronological groups, those made before 1450 AD and those belonging to the second half of the 15th century. And since the case study I'm going to discuss later on belongs to the early group, I will reverse the order of presentation and begin my account with the later group. The two groups appear as numbers one and two on your handout. I start with the second, the later group, which includes Al-Ghazali's intentions of the philosophers, Maimonides' logical terminology. Together, these two items constitute the text called Logica. Sakrobosko's Book of the Sphere, Bonfils' Six Ways, Pseudo-Aristotelian Secret of Secrets, uh, which also has some uh, uh, interpolations in Slavic, like Maimonides' treatise on sexual intercourse, a poison as an Antidotes, Book of Asthma, and a chapter on physiognomy from the second part of Razor's Al-Mansuri. Uh, another item is the Laodicean ep Epistle, specifically its first part, the eight-line cyclical maxim of On the Soul, and possibly also the collection of nine Old Testament hagiographers preserved in the 16th century Vilnius book. Now, this group consists of Ruthenian translations reflecting the language of the great duchy of Lithuania, though some of them underwent a certain degree of versification when being copied and glossed in masculine. In terms of content, it is made up mainly of medieval, medieval scholarly, oh yes, I forgot, I think, do as I do, for <laughs> Uh, in terms of content, it is made up mainly of medieval scholarly, scientific, and philosophical texts, texts mostly of Arabic Muslim provenance, which have nothing specifically Jewish about them. Although in some cases, 
they are falsely presented as Jewish, for example, in the logica where the name of Al-Ghazali is rendered in Slavic as Aviasak. This group, this group of translations is traditionally called the literature of the Judaizers, following Sabalevsky's 1903 appellation. It does indeed coincide with the emergence of the heretical movement in Novgorod and then Moscow that was labeled Judaizing by its persecutors. The translations are the product of collaboration between Jews and Slavs. For some of them, I've shown in detail in previous studies, a method of collaboration consisting in oral dictation by a Jewish translator to a Slavic scribe who took it down in writing, giving it a proper Slavonic form according to his, under, to his understanding and according to the grammatical and orthographic conventions in which he was trained. I even suggested the name of a possible translator for at least some of these texts, the Kievan Jew Zachariah ben Aaron Kohen, the copied and annotated scientific text between 1454 and 1485, first in Kiev and finally in Damascus. This timetable ma makes him a prime candidate for identification with the mysterious Jew Zachariah who accompanied Prince Alelko from Kiev to Novgorod in 1470 and who was named by Yosef Volsky as the Heresiar, fluent in black magic, astrology, and necromancy. As, as for the motives behind this enterprise of translations, a distinction has to be made between the suppliers and the receivers. For the latter, whether they be the actual receivers of this corpus in the Grand Princess Court in Muscovy, or as suggested recently by Robert Romanchuk, the intended receivers, perhaps the princely dynasty of the Olelkovich in Kiev, one may assume as motive the thirst for knowledge, combining scientific, theoretical, and practical wisdom from sources beyond those sanctioned by the church. As for the supply side, the Jews who participated in these translations, I suggested, inspired by an unpublished talk given here by Michael Schneider in 1999, that Kievan Jews such as Rabbi Moses the Exile may have had mystical motives for this enterprise of translations. In the context of the, of the eschatological <coughs> a fervor surrounding the expected end in the year 7000 from creation, <coughs> that is 1492 AD. This date coincided with the expected coming of the Messiah for some Jews, among them Rabbi Moses, who also wrote about the importance of proselytes for the process of redemption. I therefore proposed a scenario envisaging the translations as part of a pro proselytizing effort aimed at the Russian elite, an effort which almost succeeded. Learned Kievan Jews, versed in scholarly and scientific literature, translated a variety of works of rationalist tenor for Christians who were eager to gain access to such scholarly treasure, treasures unavailable to them till then whether they be in Kiev, in Novgorod, or in Moscow. However, the true agenda, at least of some of those Jews, was thus to attract their Slavic readers to Judaism. They chose an indirect approach in choosing scientific and philosophical texts, some of them, like The Secret of Secrets and its, its Maimonidean interpolations, containing practical knowledge on medicine and government. The choice of texts was thus meant to be attractive to a readership characterized more by intellectual curiosity rather than by th uh, thirst for, uh, different religious, for different religious ideas. Although these suggestions of mine were not dismissed at hand, they were met with reactions describing them euphemistically as bold and more directly as startling. Uh, I thus unwittingly and unwillingly found myself in the company of the conspiracy crowd in today's Russian nationalistic extreme right wing, who sees Jewish conspiracies always and everywhere and celebrates on internet sites and in conferences the thousand years since the victory of Russia over Jewish Kaleria or the 500 years since the Russian victory of the Judaizers. There was such a conference in 2003. I nevertheless believe this scenario deserves further consideration. As for the earlier group of translations from Hebrew, the translations made before the second half of the 15th century, the same questions of when, where, and why arise. 
Dating for this group of translations, which is number one in our handout, is a matter of controversy. It varies according to investigator, the range going from the beginning of the 12th century and even earlier to the end of the 14th. The group consists of Hebrew works, mainly historical accounts, that were integrated into Russian compila compilations such as the explanatory Paleia, which contains commented readings on, on the Old Testament, and the, the East Slavic Universal Chronicles called Chronography, Chronographs. Uh, these translations include the life of Moses and supplemented by various Midrashic sources that you see in, in your handout, except on the Yosipon and the Academic Chronograph, a complete work of the last part of the Yosipon dealing with the destruction of the Second Temple, which is called the Third Sacrament of Jerusalem by T T T Titus. And it is about this text that I'll speak in some detail in the second part of my book. I have not included here, for example, the, the stories about Solomon, since they show only thematic, not textual affinities with Hebrew sources, and have circulated before they acquired the written shape. The translations in this first group show traces of West Russian, as it's called West Russian, as well as Nov Novgorodian dialectal features, which they presumably acquired when they were edited in the course of being integrated into Russian compilations. The book of Esther, a Jewish translation, made in my view not on Hebrew but on Judeo-Greek, shares some linguistic, linguistic and particularly lexical traits with this first group and probably should also be assigned to it. On this point, too, there is no agreement <coughs> and I can see in the audience at least two scholars for whom I have enormous respect disagree with me on whether Esther was translated from Greek, as I think I've shown, together with the uh, Mishalda and Horosla, or from Hebrew, as they believe. The circumstances that, that gave rise to these conditions of the first group, which precede the emergence of the Judaizing heresy, have not been clarified. At the seminar of our research group, we discussed some weeks ago possible scenarios that could have uh, given rise to this group of translations, which on the one hand show great interest, respect, and even admiration for the Israelites of old, but nothing of the kind for Jews of their own time. These are treated as the cursed people who refuse to accept the Christian truth. Questions arise also as to the identity and bias of the persons involved in the translations and in their sub subsequent integration into Russian populations. On the one hand, the translators show acquaintance with Midrashic sources and boast about it. Thus, in retelling the account of Moses, of Moses finding Joseph's uh, bones in the Nile before the Exodus, the translator or editor adds, but you, Jew, tell us, how did they take Joseph's bones? How did they find them being sunk in the sea for 400 years? If you do not know, we will tell you. The translator, or perhaps editor, also use, uses a Talmudic expression such as comparing the making of the golden calf right after God gave Moses the tablets of the law on Mount Sinai, I quote, a, to a bride fornicating right under her wedding canopy, an expression deriving from the Talmud. But on the other hand, the compilations into which they were integrated, like the, uh, the Talkovaya Palea, abound in anti-Jewish invectives, such as do you see cursed Jew, and contain direct proselytizing attempts directed at contemporary Jews, such as, so also you Jew, don't be insensate and irrational like the snakes. The prophecies you have read, the time of creation you know. Renovate your body, regain the sights of your eyes, throw off the decayed garment which is incredulity, become renovated through the holy baptism, rush to Christ and become unanimous with us. Of Jews converted to Christianity, using Jewish source for polemics against former co-religionists. This led me to posit a scenario where the Jewish convert to Christianity involved in the first group of translations. Translations of texts dealing with the ancient Israelites and with many Old Testament figures, which are of interest to Christians. 
that some of these, these figures such as David, Ruth, Salatiel, are of obvious interest to Christians since they belong to the genealogy of Christ. Now I'm coming to the specific topic, topic of my presentation today, the, a case study exemplifying the complexity and the difficulty in uncovering and properly assessing the multiple layers of translation adaptation. And this is one of the Russian texts of the earlier group that was translated from Hebrew in the East Slavic lands before the emergence of the Judaizers. How long before the Judaizers, we don't know for sure. And the Russian, and the Russian historical compilations that it is attested from around 1400, it is titled The Third Capture of Jerusalem by Titus. That is following the first capture by Nabucodonosor in 597 BC and the second by Antipas in 167 BC. I will try here to elucidate the relation between the capture of Jerusalem and the Hebrew Yosipon, a Russian translation of which was claimed to have existed in Kiev and Rus as early as the beginning of the 12th century or even before, for example, by Nikita Mishevsky in 1958. So now to our text. Uh, these phases of evolution are presented in the handout under number three. The historical account relating the suppression of Rome by the Jude by, uh, uh, by uh, the, the suppression by Rome of the Judean revolt and the destruction of the Second Temple in the year of 70 Common Era by Titus, the Roman general who went on to become emperor nine years later, has always been of great interest to Jews and Christians alike. All the excellent narratives of these events ultimately go back to the writings of Joseph, son of Matthias, a Jew from Palestine, one of the leaders of the revolt in Galilee, who went over to the Roman side and later called himself Flavius Josephus, in honor of his master, the emperor, Titus Flavius Vespasianus. The initial text, Flavius's Jewish War, which is in fact an apologia for Vita Sua, reflects the author's tendency to rationalize and justify his betrayal, coupled with an attempt to denigrate his former comrades in arms, the stubborn rebels, and by the same token to exonerate his Roman mentors and protectors, with Titus first among them. This biased approach this biased approach of the author, who never ceased maintaining that he had always remained a loyal Jew, is, complica is complicated manifold by the time it reaches its Slavic form, or rather Slavic forms. We do in fact have several Slavic texts that carry these events. One of them is a translation of Josephus' Jewish War made from the Greek and preserved exclusively in Russian witnesses. But we'll not speak about this one. Beside this Russian version of Josephus' Jewish War, we have a different Russian text named Ziati Yerusalim Utrieti Third Capture of Jerusalem by Titus, incorporated into the historical compilation of the first quarter of the 15th century, a compilation that is known as the second reduction of the Hellenic and Roman chronicler, Irinsky, Rimsky, Tepisitz, hereafter EL2. The third capture of Jerusalem, however, is not a direct descendant of the Jewish war. It is based on the work sometimes attributed to another deserter, the second century Palestinian Jew converted to Christianity known as Hegesippus, whose account based on Josephus but augmented with Christian elements survived in Latin. In recent scholarship, this attribution has been contested and it is now customary to speak of pseudo Hegesippus, a fourth century Latin work written circa 370 AD by an anonymous Christian author. In the 10th century, an anonymous South Italian Jew translated from Latin into Hebrew large portions of Hegesippus' account, aggregating it from its most obvious Christian elements and details from other Jewish sources. This adaptation is known as the Osipon. Some passages deriving from the Osipon, for example, the account of Alexander the Great entering Jerusalem and meeting the high priest are preserved in some Russian chronicles, for example, in the Hypatian Chronicle under the year 1110. And their presence in this chronicle gave rise 
for the claim that the Yosipon, perhaps even in its entirety, was available in Russian translation in the 12th century. <coughs> the third capture of Jerusalem, however, differs from these passages in that it derives only indirectly from the Yosipon. It is actually a translation of a later Hebrew reworking done sometimes between the 10th and the 15th century of the final chapters of the Yosipon dealing with the war in Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and ending with a collective suicide of the Jewish rebels on the fortified Mount Masada in the Judean desert. This Hebrew reworking is attested in a single 15th century Hebrew manuscript, Huntington 345, from the Bodleian Library, Oxford. The Huntington version is quite distinct from both, uh, from the Yosipon, both in its wording as well as in its other episodes. <coughs> despite, <coughs> despite its carrying the title Yosipon Yossi Tengurion. <coughs> Flusser, although David, uh, David Flusser, the editor of the Hebrew Yosipon, mentions the Huntington manuscript among the manuscripts belonging to what he calls the original version, he does not include it in his Thema Codicum nor does he quote variants from it, with the exception of Elazar's speech to the rebels, gathered at Masada at the very end of the text, and even there, <coughs> Flusser's variants are not of a word or even of a phrase, as is the case with all other variant readings, but of whole paragraphs, indicating that we're dealing with a radically different text. The Russian translation of this reworking of Yosipon, called the Third Capture of Jerusalem, like all translations made from Hebrew of the East Slavic lands, has to be the work of a Jew, perhaps a Jew converted to Christianity. The earliest manuscript containing it, it's a Ban 33A13, is from the last quarter of the 15th century and shows dialectal features of the language of the Novgorod area. The Russian translation is very precious also for the history of the Hebrew text of the reworking, since it conserves portions of the text which correspond to a lacuna of six folia in the unique Hebrew Huntington manuscript. An illustrative example of the turnabouts of the, of the text, as well, of the, as well as of the differences between the Yosipon proper and its Hebrew reworking, is the following passage, number four in the handout where we find enumerated the many ominous signs that God had sent to Noah Vale to the Jews of Jerusalem in order to warn them of the forthcoming destruction of the city and the temple. In Hegesippus, which I remind you is a Christian text, this passage is clearly tainted by Christological uh, biases. Um, the city and the temple perish when the, when the temple had been made from quadrangular and Following that time, there would be a man from the region who would take up room over the whole world. This some, some thought to make reference to Vespasian, but the wider thought it made reference to the Lord Jesus, who, born in the flesh in the lands of Maria, who spread his kingdom over the, the entire space of the world. The Hebrew Yosipon modifies and censors the Christian portions of Egesipus, yielding the following text, which is number five. Uh, uh, once again, the, temple, uh, the, the destruction of the current building of the temple will be accomplished a little bit uh, quadru quadrangular. <coughs> once again, quadrangular. And finally, this will happen. Uh, at that time, there will reign a king over Israel, a king who reigns and rules over the whole earth. Hence, a part of the people said it is the king of Israel, but whereas the wise men of Jerusalem and Greece said it is the king of the Romans. So no Jesus here, but king of Israel or king of Rome. Uh, Nikita Mishersky, who edited, well, uh, maybe I'll skip this, uh, number six, yes, he, he, he tried to show that, that there was a direct uh, link between uh, uh, between uh, <coughs> uh, 
Now, he equals just two small portions of this passage from Yosipan together with the Russian text of the third capture as proof that the Russian third capture is based directly on the Yosipan. But we'll see presently that this is not the case since the Slavic capture has a version rather different. Um, now, if you look at <coughs> the example from Mishevsky number six, now if we disregard the typographic errors, and we observe that Mishevsky has left out the words where the Yosipon and capture and, and the third capture differ radically. The third capture following the Hebrew reworking of the Hanukkah manuscript predicts the appearance of this mysterious ruler of Israel who also rules over the whole world when the temple will have 420 years. Whereas the Yosipon, in the Yosipon disappearance is predicted to happen and the edifice of the temple will be quadrangular. Uh, as you can see in number seven, this is the third capture. Yes. Uh, when this house will have 400 years, then there will begin to reign over Jerusalem, the one who reigns over the whole earth, etc. And uh, the Huntington aspect you can see in number eight, it's uh, much longer. The, the, the Slavic translation abbreviated, abbreviated it somewhat, but it has the, the main elements. Uh, now, if you look at it, I won't read it. And now, most of the extra portions in the Huntington reworking, such as the ominous sign of the, <clears throat> of the beautiful human figure hovering about the temple, the cow giving birth to a lamb, and the footsteps in the temple calling for a withdrawal from the city, derive from the Yosipon too, albeit they are dispersed there in different locations and are not found in a single passage as they are in the sequence attested here. The one significant detail, however, that links the Huntington Hebrew working with the Slavic capture of Jerusalem against Yosipon is the prophecy about the temple lasting 420 years till its destruction. <coughs> a prophecy not found in Yosipon, which only speaks about the, the temple being quadrangular. Now, the number 420, as you can see in number 9, the number 420 for the duration of the second temple is a well-known Talmudic figure quoted in eschatological context. The years of the wicked shall be shortened. That is the second temple which stood for 420 years and more than 300 priests served. The account of the third capture of Jerusalem by Titus is attested not only in the Hellenic and Roman chronicle, the year two, but also in a different compilation known as the Tichon Rado chronograph, preserved in a, sixth, in a single 16th century manuscript. Elik Vorogov, who is a great philo uh, philologist, and he is the editor of year two, and knows the Tichon Rado, and knows well the Tichon Rado manuscript, and points out that the affinities between it and year two, decided never, nevertheless not to use Tichon Rado's version in his two-volume edition of, uh, uh, of PL2, on account, he said, of its idiosyncratic nature, as well as its many omissions and corruptions. Nor may we, we add, did Tvorogov consult for his edition the, the Hebrew text, the sole Hebrew text. Yet the Tichon Rabok manuscript in many instances has the better reading, preserves words and phrases omitted by all other witnesses, and omits unwarranted traditions found in the other copies. Disregarding the Tichon Rabok compilation and reconstructing the PL2 version of the third capture of Jerusalem led its editor Tvorogov to flaw Tvorogov? Tvorogov. Thank you. to flaw decisions in choosing the correct reading from among the variants. In the examples that follow, I will demonstrate how comparing the EL2 with the Hebrew as well as the Tikhon can lead to a better understand the reconstruction of the Russian translation into a better understanding of the text and of its tendencies. Uh, first instances where the Huntington uh, Hebrew version helps select the correct reading, that is number 10 in your handout. No yali that's the third. Yes, no yali yes with three skin and washa or stalas yes kena dash to be siecha residet nan you colon with you that you've captured your three walls and there remains a wall which if either a battle rises on it, it will crack it. Uh, in contradistinction, the third capture of Jerusalem in my forthcoming edition reads No Yali Yes Matrice Tene Vasha. 
etc. The Ashtar visited Lisitsa and I knew And uh, I, cho I chose this reading, of course, because the Hebrew Hanukkah has Imya uh, Aleh Aleh Shu'al. If a, even a fox climbs it, he will crack it. Had he consulted the Hebrew version of Huntington, not however of Yossi Pan Proper, which does not have this phrase, Korogov would be led not to battle as he tried to, <coughs> he tries to amend the multi text, but to the obvious solution, Bizitza, for Hebrew fox. Uh, the instances where the Tikhonrava version has a better reading than the manuscripts used by Korogov, number 11 in my hand. Chorgov in his edition has neither the Gadatsky and Ratna in the Soviet Union, not daring to watch the walls of Jerusalem. That's about Titus going up to the Mount of Olives, yes. Not daring to watch the walls of Jerusalem and the heights of her towers. The Tikhonrava version, however, has the Idiaras Gadatis and he went to inspect the walls of the city, which is much better, and also corresponds to the Hebrew in Huntington by Elekia Otchum of Yerushalayim. C. Instances where the Latin Hegesicus helps clear up an ambiguity in Hebrew which led to a mistranslation in Slavic, that is number 12 in our handout. When a man fasts for four or five days, they feed him <coughs> with the flour cooked in milk or fat until his bowels strengthen, etc. Now, Hebrew consonantal spelling chet lamed tet may stand either for halav milk or for chelet fat. The ambiguity of the Hebrew is cleared up by the immediate source of the Yosipon, Hegesipus, under peris moris est, ut supum lactis in peris, is very good in the custom many a time is to administer way to the sick of the stomach. And the Hebrew Osipon is different, but it also keeps the same ambiguity. A second example, which is number 13 in your handout, the Yasha Bolyari Natita Karizidia Natkitari, they captured a commander of Titus who was in charge of the bakers. But the Hebrew Hanukkah has, by the pursuit of Shah Fanim, Chai Asher Titus. They capture Titus chief of the vehicles, which is literally the wheels. This corruption can only be explained by supposing a misreading by the translator from Hebrew into Slavic, who read of him, bakers instead of Ophim. Uh, the Hebrew Yosipon has a more elaborate account, which you can see on the handout. Uh, and uh, the Hegesipus is different again. And the last example, no, it's not the last, the one before the last, the most, the most important are these uh, instances where the Hebrew reveals the meanings and tendencies of the Slavic translation. First example is this one, the senior handout. Speaking of the military campaign against Jerusalem and of its destruction by the Romans, the third chapter of Jerusalem has Irado Vashas, Brazi, Nashi, Agubi, Yibo, Radi. And our, our enemies rejoice over its demise. But the Hebrew hunting term is, <coughs> and enemies rejoice over her demise. Tvorogov, uh, of course, has no com comment on this edition. But this edition in the Slavic, speaking of our enemies, cannot but reflect the hand of a Jewish translator. And the final example, which is number 15, for Joseph knew they did not want peace. But the Hebrew has something different. For Joseph knew that he was abominable in his eyes, for, for he had taken upon himself the Roman yoke. Now this is a purposeful distortion of the Hebrew text, reversing the roles of hero and villain, a distortion which has to, has to belong to the translator of international. The distortion is, of course, ignored, ignored by Torah. To sum up, the Russian text of the third capture of Jerusalem by Titus and Boris, the whole spectrum of ambivalence in the attitude of Russians toward Jews, since it represents several consecutive layers of reworking and adaptation of the same account, 
with different, sometimes conflicting biases and ideas about the sense of the story and about who are the good guys and who are the bad. Are these the Romans or the Jews? Are these all the Jews or just the rebels? Is Titus the bad guy or the designed carrier of God's wrath upon the Jews? And is Joseph one of the good guys or one of the bad? Only a full comparison of all the intermediate stages that lie between Flavius' initial account and the third capture of Jerusalem as it appears integrated into the Hellenic and Roman chronicler, which is the end result, may permit us a full understanding of the ultimate form of this, of this comp composite text and let us see the modifications, some purposeful, some inadvertent, introduced by the Jewish translator into Russian and by the Christian editor of the compilation into which it was integrated. The third capture of Jerusalem by Titus thus appears to be a perfect example for illustrating the complexity of the results of Jewish Slav uh, Slavic cultural interaction. websites 
uh, celebrating the 500th anniversary of the victory of the Russian Slavic mind over the Judaizers. How do you present Judaizers to them? How do you say, what is the importance? Looking at this translation, looking at the texts they produce. Uh, can you somehow frame Judaizers culturally so that they would not uh, uh, have the aluminum presence in, uh, in Russian politics? Now, uh, let me remind you that this uh, two-sided approach, I mean, uh, uh, or even, I would say, two conflicting approaches by intellectuals uh, to the Judaizers, <coughs> we don't start now, it, it dates to, to, the, to the 19th century. Among the historians, when you, you start reading the uh, you start reading the accounts that you can find in Luria's book, where because he gives the, the most complete uh, bibliography, so you, can, you start from there. You read the 19th century historians, you see on the one hand they're clearly traumatized by this experience, but some of them also try to diminish the role and say, no, how, it cannot possibly be that the, ch the church in the 15th century and even the state what it was in real danger from these guys. Now, to the, uh, to the second part of your question, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very much uh, 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 but to me the most uh, persuasive picture of this phenomenon is the one that was made by the German philosopher uh, Thomas Siebel. Uh, he, he has written a book that was published in 1977, but unfortunately it is not unknown by, uh, by historians of the movement, or they don't quote it. Uh, it, it was never, it, there is a single review. There is only one review of this book that was written by Matei Kazaku and Avril uh, uh, Slav, and he wrote there only a, a no small note about the story of Dracula that is mentioned in the, in the footnote in the book. But it doesn't speak about the book. This is a very serious philosopher that wrote his Habilitationsschrift about the Judaism, and he sees it as an intellect, a, a, like a Bildungsbewegung by the Diachislo, by the rising Diachislo of the 15th century, the, 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 the lay, the, the lay, est, lay uh, establishment, the, the lay uh, administration of, of the princely court <coughs> is beginning to show interest in, and uh, and out of intellectual curiosity and wanting to, to, to get a, to, to get knowledge from other sources, <coughs> they they are interested in it. They are interested in it, but not for any religi religious motive, but only out of intellectual curiosity. Yeah, so I think I think this this would be I think a, a good way to present it. I mean to say. At, it is not. Uh, it, it it was not a religious movement. It was more an in intellectual movement. So, so but but you say uh, it was not. Well, two questions. I mean, first you you said it was not a religious movement. But um, uh, uh, how can we explain? Um, the name of God from the book of Exodus in uh, the Ostrog Bible. Uh, it's, uh, you, uh, it's, you, 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 you know, it, that it doesn't, you, I, um, uh, Yesim Iji Yesim, as Yesim Iji Yesim, it doesn't follow Septuaginta. It, it's, it's clearly a translation from, um, from Hebrew. Hebrew. Uh, and, um, and I know uh, even earlier text um, uh, with this trans translation. So certainly they they try to um, to, uh, to correct Bible and and there are many manuscripts with. Um, uh, Do we know anything showing that the Ostro Bible is in any way uh, connected to the Judaizers? I don't know. Or any uh, such evidence? Uh, but not of the only Ostro Bible. There are uh, a lot of well, uh, I think it's about uh, about a dozen man manuscripts. Yes. With uh, uh, with this translation, which uh, and sometimes there is imitation of, uh, uh, of Hebrew letters in the Bible. Yes, yes, yes. There, there, there are some, there are such things, and our colleague and Anatoly Alexeyev has uh, has worked and is working on these. I think he will 
yes. the as, of all the, 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 the El Shaddai is introduced. Uh, yes, right. Um, uh, so, um, surely, uh, I mean, I don't know um, whether it were, uh, uh, they were Judaizers or not, but surely it was, uh, there was some uh, uh, Judaic influence. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, no, I, I, do, I, do, I, do not, I do not deny uh, Judaic influence. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, beside, beside what we know about the Judaizers in Moscow, there was at that time also, we, we see some effects of Jewish influence on, Slav, on Russian texts in the 15th century onward. But if this is related to the Judaizers or not, I don't know. But in, in any case, of course, the Russian church had every reason to suspect uh, these people that were uh, reading, uh, translating texts that, although they had nothing specifically Jewish about them, and uh, suspecting them of, of being heretical. Yes, of course. Right. But we can practically, we cannot speak between them, between, uh, between um, uh, Judaizers and those who just wanted to, um, uh, well, well, just to, to wanted to study Hebrew and to. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, well, Luria was right about one thing, about many things, but uh, one of the things that uh, he was right about <laughs> uh, he, he was the, is, is making a distinction between the initial phase of the heresy and not the of and what happened to it in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, so since in Novgorod it began as a movement uh, among, uh, among the lower clergy, among the lower clergy when it arrived in Moscow, it, it became something a fashionable, fashionable movement among the elite, among, in, in, the, in the court, in the court and uh, uh, Fyodor Kuritsyn and uh, Elena Moldovanka and all these, all, all these people. So uh, <coughs> I don't... Uh, So, uh, <coughs> obvious, obviously, we're speaking about a phenomenon that uh, the characterization of which has to be approached differently from the, Different the way it is the way it is seen from from, from the Jewish end and the, uh, from the Jewish side, the way it was seen and on the Christian side, and even and even on the Christian side. There must have been more than one perspective on this on this movement, even at the time. I'm speaking, of course, uh, when we're looking back on it as uh, as historians, and we don't have enough of, uh, enough information. But even at the time, I'm sure that the movement looked differently to Gennady than, than it looked Certainly. to Ivan the Third, and it looked differently uh, dif uh, different to Ivan the Third, and it looked to Joseph <laughs> Boris. Every one of them saw saw in it something else. <laughs> what it, what it really was, I I don't. I think we will ever know uh, yeah. with, with precision. And another minor question. You mentioned uh, the year 1492, yes. uh, and there were uh, some Jewish scholars yes, who, yes. Yeah, who uh, spoke about the end of the world. Yes, but I, 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 was, I was thinking that it was a, a, a Constantinople uh, calculation uh, from uh, 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 there was also a Byzantine, yes. Yeah. A Byzantine, it was Byzantine. Yes. yes. So, but, so, but, so, but, so, but since there was co coincidence that right. uh, all the happy souls that were waiting for the end, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, but was to celebrate together. Yes. No, but uh, the question: uh, whether Byzantine borrowed from Jewish scholarship or vice versa. I, I don't think the Byzantine borrowed it from Jewish scholars. I, I think uh, uh, no, no. I, I think it, I think they were independent. They were based <laughs> on, different, on different calculations. For the Christian, the Christian calculation is is uh, so uh, for, for the, uh, the year seven thousand from creation is on, so the, first, on the, the first of September fourteen ninety two. They even give an hour, right? right. Four o'clock uh, in the noon or something. But, but the Christian yeah. calculation based on the fact that um, Christ was, bo um, was born 5,000, uh, five, uh, 5,508 years after the creation of the world. Right. Uh, for um, uh, Jewish scholars in... It was based on, on something else. It was based on, the, on an interpretation of a verse from the book of Job, which says, Beron Yachat Kochbei Boker, the Ariu called Neloim, when the morning stars sank together and all the... Uh, Children of God uh, uh, shouted out loud, and yeah. the first word "Beron" yeah. is uh, is calculated to mean 492, which is an abbreviation uh, 
it, no, it's a, the wrong, yes. It, it, it gives the Jewish date, which is the equivalent of 1492. So, yes. It's a, but it's based on a different couple. Seems different. to be a, a, a coincidence. Yes, yes, a coincidence. It's yes. strange. Yes, but you know, the, the conspiratorial people never believe in coincidences. It's, 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 so, <laughs> but we, we, yes, we know it is we, 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 we. Just a technical question, sorry. Uh, it's about your point number 12. I'm not sure there's an ambiguity at all. Uh, about Kalana uh, Taylor. Uh, oh, yes. yes. Here's a point where one can look at this is a medical okay. recipe, and you have to look at it, this is the best of the medical recipe. And actually, Taylor uh, Mabushal is normal. That is, you. In normal medical recipe, fact is what's cooked. So salon makes sense. It's only in the last example where you give them. Yeah, you know, chaleb also, right? When you give chaleb, the drink is an alternative. Ah. So, so that actually, in, in a sense, the, there are two separate meanings here. Okay, okay. Right. Thank you. 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 Uh, yes, he, I remember. I remember the the review paper that you wrote on Michel's edition. This is something very unusual. Yes. Writing a review paper about the book that was published uh, 20 years like, uh, before. That's right. Uh, but he's uh, not. <laughs> yeah. He's the framework of his habitation. Uh, and ah, no, I don't know. Also, so it's ah, standard. Okay. You know? Yes, sure. Yes. No, yes. I, I haven't seen it. Okay. 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 Thanks. Good. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> And to, uh, 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 number 12, a sala at the at the Nibrosta, uh, at Nibrosta, um, fat, at pork fat. Ah, it is? Yes. Okay. Sala. Yes. So it's, it makes it even more interesting. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is, is it, is it almost, is it a bit of a sala? Of course. I think it is. No. Uh, well, uh, you mentioned Russia. That uh, the third capture of Jerusalem uh, was probably uh, edited by some converted Jew with the uh, purpose uh, to proselytize. No, the monk. No, 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 no. Uh, yes. uh, uh, the, the purpose of proselytize is something that I confined to the second group of translations, not the first one, the, of the philosophical texts. Oh well, I see. Yes. So here, uh, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not making such a claim for the first group. We, no, we simply don't know the motives for the. Uh, yeah. For the first group, we simply don't know. For the second group, the I propose it only for the later group for the for the translation. My, my general question is about uh, how do you think it is possible to proselytize among Jews with church monolithic texts? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Ah, yes, yeah, no, th this is a good question about the, the, the Kovei Palea, I mean, who, who is he addressing? I mean, but he is yeah. No, but he is speaking to a Jew, I, I'm not, he is speaking, yes, there, there are, there are, spe there are uh, specific, uh, no, explicit, sorry, there are explicit addresses, say, Ty Żydowi nie żywości siwodnia, or something, uh, nie, nie żywości, nie żywości, well, we know that this anti-Jewish, uh, dialogues uh, are quite a genre with a uh, uh, good provenance, Byzantine provenance. Uh, but it is intended that they all always had in mind concrete Jews, yeah? not literary personages. Oh no, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to accept that. I think uh, Alexander wrote a lot about it and uh, he is he, saying, I think, this approximately the same thing. That doesn't mean it. Uh, More or less, even though I think you have very, very good uh, very, uh, examples there. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, yes, simply, I'm uh, almost being sensitive to uh, numbers, number significance in omens. Um, 420 and quadrangular, both beginning with four. Yes. Is, is there some uh, some earlier stage, uh, some paleographical uh, fusion here, which which could have given two different um, mm. 
interpretation. No, but the, each, each one, each one of these uh, has its own tradition. So uh, they didn't appear. So they didn't. Yeah. They didn't appear no, together. No, 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 no. no they, the quadrangle has its own tradition, and this is one of some different traditions. I don't think. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah. That's the end of our first lecture. <laughs> Many things which will emerge again.